Great. So, um, Gillian, would you like to share your screen and so your slides are up, please? And then I'll, I'll introduce you. But Will, you have a, a question. No, I clicked on it by mistake when I was okay. trying to dismiss something. OK, that's fine. That's fine. OK, great. Um, so hi everyone and, and welcome to our November reproducibility session. So today we're delighted to be joined by Dr Gillian Curry, who's a postdoctoral research fellow in the Camarades Group at the University of Edinburgh. And today Gillian's going to discuss the Edinburgh University Research Optimization Course, the UROC course, which encourages, encourages best and open research practices in animal research. So we're kind of changing course a little bit, uh, you know, and focusing more on on preclinical research today. So we hope it's of interest to you. And I'm really looking forward to, to hearing more about this course and the resources available for researchers at the university. So what the structure of today's, sorry, um, before I hand it over to, to Gillian. So the structure of today's session will kind of be the, the standard one. So we're gonna have a talk uh, from Gillian and then afterwards we'll have discussion and yeah we encourage you to 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 kind of you know um engage with the with the content and ask any questions you might have um laura and i'll be monitoring the chat throughout the the session and then we can answer them at the end okay well i'll hand it over to you Gillian. thanks so much great thank you thank you for the invite to present europe today and during the course during the talk today i'm going to describe our course and also another um research improvement project that we have coming up I'll just try to move my slide on here. There we go. So first of all, um, my disclosures, as mentioned, I'm a postdoctoral researcher with the Camarades Group. I have received funding from Bio Research and Veterinary Services to develop UROC, and I currently have funding from IAD to develop the research improvement project that I'll describe. So my perspective is that I'm a meta researcher I use the tools of systematic review and meta-analysis, and I also guide others how to use those tools, mostly um, to analyze data from preclinical models of disease. Um, my research interests include research improvement methodology. So that's where I'm coming from today. The structure of my talk, firstly, I'll describe UROC, why we developed the course and how we developed the course, and briefly describe what you can expect from the content and then in the second half of my talk, I'll describe a research improvement project where we're seeking input from yourself. So, so back to Europe. This course um, is a course covering rigorous design, conduct, analysis and reporting of research using animals. And firstly, if we think about why we chose to develop this course, let's think about science in general. So we know that science is an iterative iterative process so we're continuously learning more and more about the world around us and readjusting our theories and hypotheses based on our own results and other researchers published studies so we formulate a hypothesis test that hypothesis and then publish the results from our studies however it's only if these previous studies have been done to a high standard with high rigour that we can be confident that we're building on true results. So in this way, knowledge can grow and we can make scientific breakthroughs. However, in recent years, there's been an increased focus on how we undertake and report research using animals, and there's been great attention shown and a spotlight shown on some aspects to improve the conduct analysis and reporting of preclinical studies. And that's what I'll be describing today. So we know that 2.8 million animals were used in research across the UK in 2020. This was across fundamental and translational research and also in those legally required preclinical trials to test novel pharmaceuticals. This has helped progress our understanding of basic biology, complex disease and helped in the development of potential novel treatments. However, there are concerns over the limitations. This includes difficulties in replication, reproducibility and translation. As you'll know, there's many definitions to reproducibility, but during this talk today, I'll be talking about the ability to reproduce um, findings and inferences from previous studies. So we know across diverse disease areas or diverse research areas that there's been great difficulty in cancer biology and psychology. The majority of published findings cannot be reproduced or replicated. And when we talk about difficulties with translation from preclinical research, 
I'm talking about the fact that across many diseases, including stroke, Alzheimer's disease, Huntington's disease and Parkinson's disease, there's a fundamental mismatch between the results of preclinical research, where we identify many promising drugs, and the results in the clinic, where the drugs are found to be ineffective. And this is just a, a representation of that translational pipeline. So what we're aiming to do is take this preclinical research, research involving animals, cells or tissues, and translate findings to the clinic where that can lead to improved health. So ultimately, for these findings to be used in everyday practice. However, there's a problem with this fundamental mismatch between what we find in our preclinical research and then what works in the clinic. In fact, it's been stated that we're in the midst of a reproducibility crisis. And the seminar series, I'm sure, will be familiar with this, but uh, it was a survey conducted by Nature of over 1,500 researchers, and 52% of these research researchers stated that they believed that we are in a reproducibility crisis. And in fact, issues with replication and reproducibility compromise the usability and value of preclinical experimental data, and the estimated cost of this is thought to be 28 billion US dollars per year. So what are the reasons for this? How did we get here? Part of the reason for this reproducibility crisis and translational failure have been attributed to shortcomings in preclinical research. So this includes limited blinding and randomization, and these are measures that we can use to ensure the internal validity of our study. When we talk about internal validity, we're talking about our confidence in the cause effect relationship in a study. In preclinical studies using a model of disease, we want to be confident if we're testing a treatment that any difference in outcome we observe is due to that treatment and not due to other factors or biases that we've not controlled for. And to do this, we can use blinded assessment of outcome where the researcher is unaware of which group treatment or control group the animal belongs to when they're assessing outcome. So this um, controls for detection bias. We can also use randomization of animals to group to control for selection bias, meaning that all the animals at the beginning of the experiment, each animal has an equal chance of being in the treatment or control group. Another shortcoming in preclinical studies is small sample sizes. So there are many pressures contributing to this, and this includes the cost and desire to reduce the use of animals in research. But underpowered studies diminish our, find, our confidence in the robustness of the findings. Studies with small sample sizes are more likely to identify artifacts, meaning that future studies that attempt to replicate or build on the results of that study are set up to fail. And finally, the other issue that we'll discuss today is publication bias where the outcome of an experiment or study influences the decision whether to publish or disseminate results. We know that statistically significant results are more likely to be published, which means that the available evidence is not a true representation of all the evidence that has been collected. And one thing that we can do to combat this is the use of pre-registered protocols and also um, study registration. So this can help us protect against publication bias. These factors, among others, contribute to making findings less robust. To give you um, some background um, data on how we know these things are important, and this might be a slide that you're familiar with, but this was a study conducted by Camaradis, an early systematic review and meta-analysis of animal data. And these animals are animal models of stroke, and the drug being tested is NXY059. So this was a drug that was taken to clinical trial after promising findings in animal studies, and it failed at clinical trial. So the Camaradis group were interested in the reasons for this and went back to analyse the animal data in more detail. The outcome reported here is infarct volume. So we're looking at um, the efficacy of a drug to reduce infarct volume. The, date, the systematic review um, identified 11 publications of 29 experiments, and this is data from 408 animals. It was found across the literature that NXY059 improved outcome by 44%. However, when we looked at stratified data according to whether they used measures to reduce the risk of bias, so these measures of randomization, blinded conduct of experiment, and blinded assessment of outcome, we found that studies that took these measures to reduce the risk of bias were associated with significantly smaller effect sizes. And the idea that you can usually find out 
find what you're looking for is not new. This is a study, or this is um, a summary of a study published by Rosenthal in 1963. He asked his graduate psychology students to conduct an experiment which involved the T maze apparatus and rats. So the T maze um, has a, a light arm and a dark arm, and in this experiment, the dark arm was reinforced with a food reward. So he was he asked the students to test two groups of rats. These were maize bright and maize dull rats. The maize bright rats had been bred over many generations to perform well in this type of test, and the maize dull rats were standard laboratory rats. The students ran this test over five days and consistently reported that the maize bright rats performed better than the maize dull rats. However, it turns out that the experiment was not on the rats, but on the students themselves. In fact, all the rats were from the same cages in the same animal house and were standard laboratory rats. And this experiment just shows how important it is, um, what our expectation bias and the influence this has on the results that we observe in an experiment and how important it is to blind throughout an experiment. And we have evidence from various neuroscience domains of the impact of measures to reduce the risk of bias. So this slide shows data from stroke, Alzheimer's disease, multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's disease. So animal models of these diseases. And it was found consistently across different measures to reduce the risk of bias that those that took these measures reported smaller effect sizes. And in fact, this isn't just an issue across neuroscience research. So these are the areas that we've been interested in and looked in more detail, perhaps because drugs haven't worked at clinical trial. But it is actually something that can be observed across the literature that there's low reporting of measures to reduce the risk of bias. We um, went to date, we took data from the top UK institutions. So this, um, we identified the top five institutions from RAE 2008, which was a precursor to REF. So it was a way of ranking the top UK institutions. Edinburgh was one of these institutions. And we looked at the published in vivo literature across two years, so 2009 to 2010. We identified 1,173 in vivo studies. And across those studies, there was low reporting of randomization, blinded assessment of outcome, inclusion exclusion criteria. So that's predetermined inclusion exclusion criteria for your animals and the use of a sample size calculation. We can see that only 15% of papers reported randomization, just over 15% reported blinded assessment of outcome, around 10% reported inclusion exclusion criteria, and very few reported sample size calculations. In fact, across these studies, only one study reported all four measures to reduce the risk of bias, and that was a study from Oxford. You'll see here that we've um, colour coded the institutions, so we've not named them, but I can say that Edinburgh is a lovely Scottish blue colour. So this research and more has increased focus on how to enhance reproducibility across preclinical research, which is what I'm pre presenting today. So there's been increased focus on study validity, so taking these measures to reduce the risk of bias and ensure the internal validity of a study. Increased focus on methodological rigour, so that includes ensuring appropriate power by using sample size calculations, using the appropriate statistics on, on, a, on any data gathered, and also um, using p-values when appropriate. And there's also a push for increased transparency, and there's you can really see the evolving um, way that we're pre-registering our studies, the way that we're reporting, thoroughly reporting our methods and sharing our data. For example, sharing of data allows reuse so people can analyse without testing more animals, or it also allows people to look fully at your data set rather than just the summary statistics that we often present in our manuscripts. And the motivating idea behind the UROC course is to help everyone, no matter how skilled they already are, do their science that little bit better. So take into account these things that we've talked about to improve our science. So here in cartoon form, we imagine the distribution of research quality ranging from the frankly shocking at one end to the utterly fantastic at the other. The distribution we think has a positive skew in that most research and most researchers are already pretty good. The extreme left of the distribution is characterised by things like falsification, fabrication and plagiarism. So these are very uncommon, but very serious when they do occur. Through to things like harking, so hypothesising after results are known. Not taking measures to reduce risks of bias. 
through to higher quality research. So for instance, by adoption of open science practices, like we mentioned, so sharing of data, the use of electronic lab notebooks, more transparency in how we um, share our data, um, ultimately through to things like the use of pre-registration, things like registered reports. So this, you may be familiar with these, but it's a form of journal article in which our methods and proposed analyses are pre-registered and peer reviewed and before we conduct our research. And often the journals will, will guarantee to um, publish your research regardless of the result of that research. So the central idea behind this course is to inform small incremental improvements in the research that we do. So wherever a researcher is on this spectrum, there will always be something that can be done differently, some change that can make their research even better. And if as a community, we're all able to improve what we do even by a small amount, the overall effect on the quality and the value of the research which we produce will be substantial. So the aims of Europe are to raise awareness of critical research design issues and support the improvement of research at the university by providing everyone involved with animal research with knowledge of how to increase the rigour of the design, conduct, analysis and reporting of research using animals. So one thing to point out here is this course is suitable for anyone at any stage of their career. So it may act as a refresher course of things that have been covered in undergrad and PhD training, or it may shine a spotlight on some aspects or tools that people weren't aware of. So we think that is um, suitable for any research stage and also those that work with animals. So not just researchers, but those that work with animals um, involved in research. We hope that completion of Europe will lead to improvements in the rigour of animal research at the university, and we hope that a small improvement manifest across large numbers of researchers will have a substantial effect. To give you an idea of how we developed Europe, so we took um, a systematic review of guidelines for the internal validity of lab studies involving animals, and we took these guidelines and developed content for the course. We have a course structure of four modules, a welcome module that gives some more in-depth um, information on the data behind the development of the course. And then we have three um, content modules, which are study design and data analysis, experimental procedure and pre-registration and reporting. Each module has a core lecture and an extended lecture, so you can complete the course to the level at which you would like. And you can also um, test your knowledge throughout the course using quiz questions that are part of the course and there's links to further reading materials and further tools and resources from the course. The course doesn't have to be completed in a single sitting but can be completed across multiple sessions and there's an option to download completion certificates which will record um, which level you completed the course to. To give more in-depth idea of what the content is, for example, in module one, we'll cover things like internal validity, so something I've briefly described today, measures to reduce risks of bias. We'll also look at construct and external validity and how to consider this in your research design and look at the difference between exploratory and confirmatory research. There's also um, a section on data analysis, so I won't read all these bullet points out, but within the course, it's possible to, this is just the core content shown in this slide, but it's possible to go to these slides, click on the section that you're interested in and just study that section if that's what you would like to do. So there is um, the option not to complete every single part of the course. But what we hope you will learn if you do complete the course is to how to you consider risks of bias and how to minimise their impact on your experiments, how to distinguish between different types of collected data, how to plan your analyses and what to look out for, how best to report your results in order to allow others to understand and reproduce what you did, how to maximise construct and external validity when designing your experiments, the importance of study pre-registration, how best to present different types of data and where to find further resources on the topics presented in the course. The way we hope to measure the success of the course is our feedback form. So within the UDOC course on Learn, there's um, an invitation to fill out a feedback form. So we'd encourage everyone to do that. We will continue to measure institutional performance in research design, conduct and analysis and reporting, both in experimental request forms and in published work. And that'll include measuring the reporting of measures to reduce the risk of bias and revisions of the course will be rolled out as we receive feedback and as we learn from further research. 
We have made this course not just available to researchers at the University of Edinburgh, but we have also made it widely available because we believe that when research skills increase in other institutions that will all gain. So this includes the skills that they'll bring when they come and join our institution, but also when we're working to build on other research findings, we want to include these are we want to ensure help ensure that these are true results. So by increasing study rigor, we can do that. We hope that this course can be used as evidence of training for people. So downloading those certificates, that can be um, something that's useful. And we plan to develop future components. So that might be a component on systematic review of preclinical studies. That's something we're interested in, but we'd also be interested in any ideas of um, other content that would be useful to people. So for those at the University of Edinburgh, we'd encourage you to access the course via Learn. So that includes uh, that involves clicking on the self enroll tab at the top right hand corner of the screen and learn scroll down to research improvement courses at the bottom of the screen and click on UDOC. So that's how you would access. There's also a link which we'll share in the Teams chat, which is for those outside the university to um, access the course directly without having to go through learn. So to finish the first half of my talk about UROC, I'd like to thank the team that were involved in the development of UROC. So Malcolm McLeod and Leslie Penny, Emily Senna, Jeanette Bahor and I, who developed the content. We'd also like to thank the University of Edinburgh and the AWERB for their feedback and support in the development of the course. Now for the second part of my talk, um, I'd like to describe a new research improvement project that we're just in the design stages of. Um, the reason for this project is the problem that we identified are delays in the dissemination of our research findings, which cause delays in scientific progress. So when we talk about delays in the dissemination, we're talking about the delay that occurs at the journal. So when we submit our journal and how long it takes for research to be published. And the delays to scientific progress, we're talking about delays to benefit, so delays in the development of new treatments, delays for, for other researchers learning from and building on our results, and delays in the attainment of further funding to progress that research. Some pilot work that was completed by Alex Clark within the Camarades group, we, um, Alex looked at the submission of experimental request forms and these being approved. So th this is how we um, submit an experiment for approval to the AWERB and then we would have permission to start that animal experiment. So from this submission and approval to then submission to the journal and then from acceptance to the journal to publication, she measured the time between experimental request forms submitted in 2014 and found that the Median duration from the start of an experiment, so being allowed to start your experiment, to publication is around three years, so 987 days. And interestingly, from submission to the journal to actual full publication is 235 days. So around 25% of this research cycle that I've described is taken up at the journal. So our idea is that preprint servers offer an excellent addition to publication in traditional journals. So the time from submitting to a preprint server to actual the, the preprint being available to the public is only 48 hours. And we know that preprints are rooted in open science or open access, allow revisions and corrections and support open peer review and transparency. Unfortunately, they are underutilised in biomedical research. So this is where I'd like to actually take a poll of those listening today and maybe um, I think that perhaps Laura, you were going to share your screen for a poll. Um, yes, so we would like to me. ask who has actually used a preprint server to share their work um, before I go into the next part of my talk, as it'll determine how much depth I should go into describing these. So I'll stop sharing for now. Yep, thank you. Oh, so we've got 50-50 at the moment.
think there should be a few more on, but <laughs> from those that have managed to fill out the poll here, it looks like eight have used preprints and, and six have not used preprints before. I will go back to sharing my slides again now. So as I mentioned, we know that um, we know that it takes around 235 days for publication from submission to publication in a journal, um, but we could reduce that by using preprints. So for those that have used preprints, you'll know that it's an early version of a scholarly article that has not necessarily undergone peer review. Most people would um, publish a preprint at the same time as submission to a journal, so you would you would submit to your preprint server the article that you're submitting to be considered for publication, but that's not always the case. It might be that people put their research up as a preprint, but never actually submit it to a journal. So it's, there's no guarantee that it will be published if you find it on a preprint server. These servers that I describe are things like for our research, bioarchive, open science framework preprints, but that each field has their own um, preprint servers that would be useful to them. So why would I use a preprint server? The reason that we've identified so far and um, UKRN have released something to um, also describe this in more detail about why preprints are useful, but we recognise that rapid dissemination and timely sharing of research findings is useful. So it, it gets around this problem of a delay between submission and publication. We know that it increases the visibility of people's work, so open access can increase readership and citation. It establishes the priority of new ideas, so it's publicly timestamped and registered, so people know that this was um, when you originally um, completed this work and submitted your idea um, to a journal. And they're also open to comments and feedback, so people have found it really useful in terms of sharing their preprint, perhaps putting that on academic Twitters, soliciting feedback, and then updating their preprint based on that feedback. But I think something to point out here is there's also the weariness around preprints of you have to be mindful of potential non-expert interpretations of those findings because they're open to the public and you need to make sure that you're happy with the data that's out there. And um, I guess another positive thing actually is it's increasingly positive it's increasingly common for preprint repositories to be the go-to location to discover new research. So it's somewhere that people are searching for new findings. Interestingly, funders are, um, they're evolving in terms of how they want to use preprints and how they um, use them in the assessments of um, researchers' work. So Wellcome, for example, encourage researchers to post preprints of their work. They have recommended a license to use, and they also require the publication of research using preprints if it's um, relevant to significant public health benefit, for example, COVID or a disease out, another disease outbreak. So they have um, quite strongly said that they would require the use of preprints. Journals on preprints, each journals have their own um, rules on this, so it would be worth checking wherever you want to pu publish your research what their rules are, but one way to do that is using this Sherpa Romeo tool, and it um, allows you to um, look up a journal and find their open access policies and also preprint policies, so that's a really useful tool. So the idea behind this research improvement project is our aim is to increase the speed research findings are disseminated by increasing the use of preprints. So we plan to measure the proportion of animal studies that are indexed as preprints um, currently. So we'll be looking at 2017 experimental request forms to see how many have went to preprints. We want to um, identify the challenges and opportunities around preprint. So we would be really keen to develop some focus groups with key stakeholders, including um, students, researchers, those in leadership roles and those in senior leadership at the university to identify really what the barriers are to using preprints and whether there's um, anything that we've not considered when we're, we've put together this project idea. And, Following on from those focus groups, we'd really like to ask um, members of the focus groups to help 
develop a strategy to a methodological approach to increase the use of preprint. So the, the things identified using the, or the challenges and opportunities identified during the focus groups will then help us develop this approach. So, for example, we, we wonder whether seminar series would be useful and what information would be helpful during those, perhaps um, an online um, video or um, animation to try and encourage the use of preprints. These are the types of things that we'll be considering and what content would go into those. So that's really why um, I wanted to share this project. What we'd like is to get uh, people that have used preprints and pe people that haven't yet used preprints. And we would like um, from all career stages at the university, and we would really like to ask for some volunteers to give some time to this project. It will only be one focus group early next year. So that's one thing. It's just one focus group. And then for anyone that's interested, they can volunteer to come to one design meeting as well. So we plan to implement whatever methodological approach we designed during this project and then measure again. I think we have decided on the 2018 experimental request form. So one year after we first measure, we'll do a follow up measure to see whether there's been any increase in the use of preprints. And obviously that any increase wouldn't just be due to our research improvement project as there are other initiatives going on trying to encourage the use of preprints, but it could give us an idea of whether we've had any um, improvement, any sort of increase in the use of preprints at the university. So that's really um, all I would like to say is we're looking for volunteers to join focus groups and I'll put my email address up for anyone that would like more information or that's on the Europe course or on our research improvement project that I've described in the second half of the talk. So thank you for listening. Hi Gillian, thanks so much for that. That was really interesting and it's wonderful to see, you know, a, a resource, you know, kind of like having all of these ideas and then actually like channeling it and creating a resource for the research community. So yeah, it's a fantastic effort and really, really, really interesting. Um, so I suppose, Laura, do you have yeah. anything to add? No, just thanks no. very much and I'm just going to yeah. stop the recording now and then we can go on to the discussion part. Um,